So this is what a typical bacterial cell looks like. Sometimes they'll have this tail called a flagellum. Um, they have DNA in their cytoplasm. But again, I don't want you to know specific details yet. We'll kind of be discussing that at length. Just, I just wanted you to get a sense of what they look like. Here's an animal cell, typical animal cell. Again, a sense of what it looks like. Uh, most animal cells do not have a flagellum sticking off, uh, but I think it, they put it here just because some do. But anyways, uh, the, an animal cell has a lot more going on, as you can tell. Again, we're going to talk about this stuff at length, sort of mitochondrion powerhouse, right, of the cell, as uh, I believe Danielle said in the chat. We're going to talk about the Golgi apparatus. We're going to be talking about ribosomes, the plasma membrane, uh, the nucleus, endoplasmic reticulum. These are all of our organelles. These are organelles in our cell, which we will again talk about. This is just to see what does it look like? I think this is a cool picture. Here's a plant cell and, you know, pretty similar, right? A lot of the same stuff that you're, you see in your animal cell, uh, mitochondria, Golgi apparatus, nucleus, uh, ribosomes, and uh, these endoplasmic reticulum, rough and smooth. A uh, couple differences that we'll highlight uh, throughout this lecture series. Chloroplasts, we don't see in animals. These uh, green organelles here with these discs stacked inside. Uh, and then of course there's this very uh, rigid structure called a cell wall that actually surrounds the cell and the cell membrane. So I'm trying, there it is, plasma membrane. So this uh, plant cells also have a cell membrane just like uh, our animal cell does, but they also have this additional very firm structure called a cell wall that's going to give plant cells their shape and rigidity uh, to withstand, uh, you know, different condition, weather like wind and rain or animals that trample over them or whatever. So um, those are part of the uh, plant cells. We've also, we learned what they're made of. Who remembers from last unit what our cell, the cell walls are made of? What is that structural biological molecule? Yeah, cellulose, totally. So they have that cellulose cell wall. And just a fun fact, like really, really fascinating. Uh, it's good to have cellulose, to eat cellulose. The reason being, we don't have the enzyme to digest cellulose called cellulase. As you'll learn in the lab this week, we have amylase, so we can digest starch uh, from plants, potatoes, we can corn, we can digest that, we can use it for energy, but we cannot digest cellulose. And so we call it in, indigestible, insoluble fiber in our diet, and that's good. We don't want to digest cellulose. The reason is, we can't fully digest it. We can degrade it a little bit with stomach acid, but as it passes through the intestines, our, we don't have an enzyme to break it down. So it's still kind of intact and solid in the stool and it'll, it'll abrade, it will uh, scratch, scratch, what's the word? Abrade in the textbook. Uh, it's going to hit. <laughs> and swipe against intestinal walls. And this is good because it actually stimulates the intestines to secrete mucus and help things pass through. 
And that's good because if things sit, causes inflammation, uh, can increase risk of colon cancer. Uh, so fibrous foods like vegetables with lots of cell walls of cellulose, it's good stuff. We don't, it passes through, it keeps things moving. <laughs> so anyway, interesting fact. All right, so let's begin. Uh, if we get to organelles today, great. Uh, if not, no problem. Uh, we can focus on that next time. But today, I really want to finish and focus on before going inside of our cell, we're going to focus on the outside of it. And we're going to focus on that barrier called the cell membrane. And what does a membrane look like? What, it, what is the membrane? What is function? What is it doing? And we're again, like I said, we'll we'll also talk about transport today because that relates to the membrane. And what kinds of substances, what kind of molecules are going to be able to cross the membrane, either into our cell or out from inside out? So let's begin with the membrane, cell membrane. Okay. So the membrane that surrounds cells is called the cell membrane. Uh, it's also called the plasma membrane. Same exact thing. So you might see that term in the textbook too. It refers to that membrane that surrounds the cell. Okay, first thing I'll say about a cell membrane, all cells have a cell membrane. All cells on the planet have a cell membrane. Bacteria, plant cells, animal cells, fungi, uh, I named most of life, um, <laughs> protists, uh, like amoebas and um, seaweed, uh, algae. So they, they all have cell membranes, right? The cell membranes, it, what it does is it, uh, it separates the internal environment of the cell from the outside world. Um, thinking, yeah, maybe I'll write that down. So the cell membrane separates the internal environment from the outside world kind of acts as this barrier, right? And by acting as this barrier, it actually has this really important function of regulation and regulating what can enter and what can leave. So also write uh, acts as a regulator of molecules moving in or out of the cell. Uh, so it allows certain things to move into the cell and certain things to not move into the cell. It's a barrier, right? You can kind of think of it as like a castle with a with uh, uh, you know how like, you know, you'd watch Game of Thrones and castles, they have those walls, right? Uh, or any castle you have, it closed off, right? With walls, but then you have like a door, like a giant door with guards in front. That's exactly what's going on here. 
uh, not exactly, obviously, <laughs> but uh, those giant doors you're gonna see when we draw our membrane uh, are actually proteins in our membrane. And they, right, those giant doors can allow certain things to come in, but really block most things and have that protective wall barrier. Okay. So the first thing that we got to learn with the cell membrane is what it's made of. And I think, I, be I believe I mentioned it in our last unit when we talked about lipids, that membranes are made of lipid, a specific type of lipid. So the cell membrane, is composed of a modified lipid called a phospholipid. You guys remember that, the phospholipid? Forgot to mention also, um, this, this sort of regulation uh, function, uh, we, call the, we call that be, the membrane being semi-permeable. That's kind of the, uh, the term for being this regulator. Uh, so the membrane is semi-permeable semi plasma membrane. I totally ran out of room. Ugh. So it's semi-permeable. Some things can cross through and others cannot, or permeate the membrane. That just means to uh, go through it, into or out of the cell. So it's semi-permeable. OK, back to our phospholipid. Let's draw one. Let's see what a phospholipid looks like. It's going to look familiar to when we drew uh, uh, our triglyceride. Remember our triglyceride had uh, that glycerol backbone with three fatty acid tails coming off of it. Our phospholipid has a region towards the top. I'm going to make it green and then it has two tails coming off of it. Let's start with the top. The top here is called the phosphate head of our phospholipid. So this is the phosphate head. And then coming off of the phosphate group on top, this phosphate head region, are two fatty acid tails. So these are two fatty acid tails. All right, so I'm actually gonna erase the top here and keep my phospholipid because I wanna show you something.
I want to show you why this uh, phospholipid is a really brilliant design for cell membranes, for all membranes. Remember, cells are in an, a, what we call an aqueous environment. Every, water, water is that solvent. So everything's in water. The cell is surrounded by water and inside the cell is water, uh, primarily with organelles uh, kind of, you know, floating within that water. But it's in a, we're in a water world. <laughs> All life is water world, okay? Um, and I'm gonna mention that this phosphate head, now, if you remember, if you recall, we talked about phosphate groups when? When did we talk about phosphate groups? Or rather, what do you remember about them? Yeah, DNA, nucleotides. That's right. When we talked about nucleic acids, we saw those phosphate groups. Uh, there was a phosphate in a nucleotide attached to that sugar and nitrogenous base, ringing bells. Um, what, what, what did we see? What was characteristic of that phosphate? I think I mentioned it. I hope, I mean, if I didn't mention it, it's okay. I'll mention it here. It's more important here, but PO4, totally. It's a phosphorus with those ox four oxygens. Yes, it's negatively charged, negatively charged. And that wasn't so important when we talked about the nucleotides, uh, but it's important here because, first of all, I'm gonna write, this is a PO4, let's put in parentheses, with a two minus charge. Now, because this has a minus charge, I'll just do it in red to kind of emphasize it. And we're in an aqueous world. What's gonna happen is the water molecules, as we learned, uh, they are polar, right? So they have part of the molecules positive, partial positive, and part of the molecule is partially negative. And we know from our uh, basically law of the universe, opposites attract. And so I'm going to draw a few water molecules up here. And because these hydrogens have partial positive charges, right? They're actually going to be attracted to these phosphate heads. Right? And so because of that, the phosphate head, that region or that group, we call it hydrophilic. It's a hydrophilic head. Hydrophilic. So the phosphate head is hydrophilic, which means water loving. It's attracted to it. Okay, awesome. On the other hand, our fatty acid tails are what we call hydrophobic. They're hydrophobic. So I'll do that in here. The fatty acid tail region is hydro phobic, which means water fearing. Now, without getting too involved in the chemistry of why the hydrophobic regions are water fearing and they repel water, they don't 
want to be near it. Um, it is why oil and water don't mix. It is why oil likes to form those uh, spherical sort of droplets and separate from the water and stick to itself. Uh, and again, oils are lipids and this fatty acid region is characteristic of a lipid, right? Uh, in fact, all lipids have some kind of hydrophobic uh, characteristic to them. Uh, this ends up being important in how the, our cell membrane is going to really separate from the world and kind of internalize and have its own internal environment. Because in a world of water that it's surrounded by, what better barrier than something that repels water, right? What better way to guard and regulate things coming in? But speaking of that membrane, I want to show you what it looks like because you'll see what I mean by this, this quality of the phospholipids being a good barrier. So let's see, I think I'll erase this. We have as much room as possible to draw our membrane. So first I'm gonna kinda do a very simplistic, simplistic cell. So that's kinda like what it would look like on the microscope. Uh, this would be the cell membrane or plasma membrane, which I often abbreviate as PM, plasma membrane. And that darkly shaded region, don't worry too much about that right now, but that's our nucleus of the cell. I'll label that too, might as well. I just, I draw it like this because it's what it looks like under the microscope. Whenever you stain a cell with these dyes, it really intensely, darkly stains the nucleus like that. And then you can lightly see that plasma membrane surrounding the cell. But I just like to do that because I'm just gonna zoom in on this membrane. So I'm just zooming in on this portion of the membrane here. And it's gonna look something like this. All right. So what we have in our membrane is a double layer. And I left these gaps for a reason, you'll see. We have a double layer of these phospholipids. And so I'm gonna color in these phosphate head groups as with this green, like before. And you'll notice that this double layer of phospholipids, the fatty acid tails face each other, right? They face inward like that with the polar head regions facing out, those negatively charged phosphates facing outward. So let's uh, go ahead and label this as a so I said it was a double layer of phospholipids. We also call this a phospholipid bilayer. 
This is our phospholipid bilayer. All membranes are composed of this phospholipid bilayer. You'll, you'll see as we move on that the plasma membrane isn't the only membrane. It's a very important one, but there'll be other membranes involved. All made of phospholipid bilayers. Okay, so if we're zooming in here, this would, this would be the outside of the cell up here. This would be the inside of the cell. And to emphasize again, we've got water molecules out here. And we also have water molecules in here, inside our cell. Life is water-based. Cells are based of, in water. And now you can kind of get a sense and appreciation of why this is a good barrier. Uh, other than these huge gaps, we're going to fill them in, don't worry. <laughs> uh, but these phospholipid tails here, just like oil and water, really separate from the inside and outside. And if anything wants to pass through, it's got to get through these fatty acid tails. And when we look at transport, you'll see it's not so easy. You've got to be a very specific type of molecule if you want to get through. But we'll look at that uh, next. Okay, so what are we missing here? We are missing a very important component of cell membranes. We have cell membrane proteins. I think I made my gap too big, but eh, not really. These proteins are very big and they take up the span of our membrane kind of like this. So we have these membrane proteins embedded in our cell membranes. So this is a membrane protein. So you'll find membrane proteins in all of our cell membranes. And their primary role is to be a gatekeeper. It's that door in the castle. Uh, so they control transport as gatekeepers. So let's write control transport. Okay, and I left one more space up here that we should fill in. It's another important uh, molecule that we find in membranes. We talked about it, I mentioned it uh, last unit. Does anyone know what it was? It had a role in stabilizing the cell membrane. Cholesterol, absolutely. So what color have I not used? I'll use purple again. So cholesterol, the steroid lipid molecule, and it kind of has those, has that characteristic ring structure, those rings like this. So this is cholesterol. And cholesterol's uh, significance is that it stabilizes the cell membrane. Basically, the study, studies have just, they basically demonstrate that if you lower temperatures enough, 
without cholesterol, the cell membrane is really stiff and it can break, but the cholesterol somehow allows at lower temperatures, uh, I believe higher temperatures too, for the cell membrane to remain fluid enough that it doesn't break. But for our purposes, I just want you to know that cholesterol is there in our membranes, very important, and that it stabilizes the membrane, keeps its integrity intact. Color this in and make it look cool. All right. I believe that's all I wanted to say about the cell membrane. So is there any questions before we talk about transport across the membrane? Oh, that's a great question. Why is high cholesterol bad? It actually gets into some seriously advanced biochemistry. <laughs> and I've forgotten a lot of it, but I might have to get back to you on it. In fact, I'm gonna look into it again, but it has something to do. So there's a bad cholesterol versus a good one. And so there's a cholesterol, uh, actually, no, no, that was different. Or maybe it wasn't, HDL, LDL. Yeah, it's been a while. I gotta relook. I gotta revisit that stuff. Uh, but I know I, I'm pretty sure it plays a role in formation of plaques in arterial walls. Uh, I think cholesterol can sometimes, if you have too much, it can aggregate and it won't go into cells as easily. It's my best guess. I gotta, but I'm gonna look into that again. So next time I'll have your answer. Yeah, I totally forgot. Phospholipids stack. Um, they don't really stack. Uh, I mean, if you mean, um, they certainly don't stack like this. They don't, they don't stack on top of each other like that, but they, they just, they kind of, they, you know, uh, cells in our environment will, depending on how the cells are oriented vertically, horizontally, or, uh, or, you know, and they're, maybe they're floating in the bloodstream, right? Blood cells. Um, whatever it is in that three-dimensional space, they don't stack, but they just face each other. These phospholipids just face each other at all times, kind of like that depending on how the cells are orienting. Good questions, getting stumped today. I like when I get stumped, I gotta review stuff. Um, all righty, let's move on. Transport, transport, transport summary. So this is our next, next, uh, concept. Okay, so we've got different forms of transport that we're gonna talk about. And as you can see on this slide, this is basically what we just drew, right? These are our, this is our phospholipid bilayer, those fatty acid tails facing inward um, and this hydrophobic region. And then we got our polar head groups on either side. 
outside of the cell, inside. So we're transporting from outside of the cell, inside. And we're gonna talk about four modes of transport, really. Uh, there's three here, but I'm gonna mention one more in addition to this. Um, okay, so let's start with our first on the top there. Our first mode of transport is called simple diffusion. And simple diffusion is the movement of small molecules of small molecules from a high concentration. So those brackets denote concentration. So I'll write that in. So a high concentration of molecules to low concentration of molecules. So example, simple diffusion. Uh, gases will move by simple diffusion across the cell membrane. Uh, just shown in this, just like it's shown in the slide there. So, oxygen gas, O2, carbon dioxide, CO2. These are small molecules, and you'll notice with simple diffusion. Take a look at this slide here. All these forms of transport were we're getting through the membrane, right? And you'll notice here, this is our simple diffusion, high concentration of these gas molecules here on, on the outside of the cell, and we're diffusing to a lower concentration. And I want you to keep this in the back of your mind for when we do our next uh, form of transport. Notice how these gas molecules can kind of they're small and they can easily, uh, you know, they can get through that membrane. They can kind of uh, weasel their, <laughs> weasel, what's the word? They can navigate through this uh, bilayer straight on through, right? But when we talk about our next form of transport, the molecules can't do that. It's a different type of molecule. It needs some help, as you can see here. So let's go ahead and talk about that. Our next form of transport, it's called facilitated diffusion. And facilitated diffusion, the molecules need help from what you just saw, a membrane protein. So that, this is going to be facilitated diffusion. And facilitated diffusion is the movement of large molecules. Uh, again, from a high concentration to low. That concentration difference is you're going to see with our third form of uh, diffusion is important. Um, I'm also going to add, actually, for your definition here, it's the movement of large molecules from a high concentration to a low concentration and requires a membrane protein. That we call transporters, transporter proteins. Or maybe it's a protein 
that's a channel protein or a, yeah, usually they're transporters. Oop, membrane protein. And I'll add a transporter. So in facilitated diffusion, just, you know, if, you, if you're going further in biology, this, you'll really want to pay attention to the fact that there's a sort of, just going along with this concept of uh, lipid and phosphate group charge, so charge molecules like that phosphate that's attracted to polar charge molecules like water versus lipids that don't have charge uh, or any polarity. That's like a hallmark of lipids. Uh, oftentimes things that can go straight through the membrane without a protein to help, they don't have charge. They can mix in and associate with those fatty acid tails without charge pretty easily. So oxygen, CO2, they don't have charge to them. So they can kind of just slip right through. They're also small. Uh, but facilitated diffusion, oftentimes the larger they're larger molecules and they have a charge to them. So certain proteins, amino acids, sugars have some charge uh, on certain groups. And so that, they can't just traverse. They cannot just cross the membrane willy-nilly. They need the help of that guiding transporter protein. So I'm just going to add an example. Sugars, amino acids. Amino acids certainly have charged regions. Remember, those were our building blocks of proteins. Remember, inside the cell, we're manufacturing proteins, right? So we're going to need to get amino acids from our diet. Proteins we eat break down to those amino acids. We got to get them into the cell. The only way we can do that are with is facilitated fusion and having membrane proteins, transporter proteins. Okay. Last form, actually not the last form of transport, but well, <laughs> second to last, but the, the last form of transport when I do mention, it's actually a specific type of diffusion that is similar to this. I'll get there, but let's talk about a form of transport that's radically different than these two. It's called active transport. I ran out of room, so I'm just gonna erase. It's called active transport. Very specific reason, it's active. So active transport. Our last form of transport. And it's gonna be the movement Maybe I'll do it in a different color to emphasize this. It's going to be the movement of molecules, really small or large, any molecules. Let me show you the slide just to engage with you guys. What do you think is different here? That's from the top two. Just right away, what do you what do you notice about concentration? Where are we? What's moving here? What's going on? Yeah, low to high. We've been talking about high to low, right? Active transport, our last form of transport here. We're going from a lower concentration to higher, and we'll see. That's not easy. It's against thermodynamic law. <laughs> it's not easy. And we'll see that it requires an input of energy. 
It's active transport. It's a process that requires energy, a very important one. So movement of molecules from, let's do green, from low concentration to high. And I have a fun analogy to remember this. Let me get some water first. Okay, before I talk about the analogy, let's write that it requires energy. And as you saw on the slide, it requires ATP. We learned is our energy currency of the cell. It's kind of like a battery. Whenever we have a process, a reaction, uh, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Um, Drawing a blank right now, but uh, whenever we have an energy requiring process, we need one or more molecules of ATP. It's our high energy molecule. So requires ATP energy. It's active transport. Okay. So an example of active transport in our cells, a really important one example uh, is the sodium potassium pump. So often, the, the proteins involved in it, active transport in the membrane, we call them pumps because they're actually pumping uh, molecules against their concentration gradient. That phrase means, really it means low to high. Uh, you can think of it kind of like a waterfall. A waterfall or really, uh, there's tons of examples. Perfume in, in a room. Uh, when you pour milk into coffee, all of these things, you have high concentration, like perfume, for example, if I spray some perfume at this corner of the room, high concentration of those perfume molecules here, right? But you wait a few minutes and they spread out to where there's low concentration at the other end of the room. And if you're at the other end, you wait a few minutes and then you can smell it, right? It's, this is different. This is going from low to high. It's not really natural. And so you kind of, you need an energy input. You got to force it to do that. Uh, you're kind of making the waterfall go back up. It's, just, it's weird. And you got to use your energy to do that, right? Against gravity. So it's sort of like that. And an example of a pump protein that does this is the sodium potassium pump. Uh, in neurons or nerve cells. Uh, not to get too in-depth, to take uh, uh, neurobiology, neuroscience, you'll learn a lot about this and action potentials and how electrical signals are conducted using this pump and uh, it's active transport. It's very important, requires a lot of energy. Uh, in ATP. But essentially, sodium is being pumped out of the cell 
when there's low sodium in the cell and a lot of, so of sodium outside of the cell. And, um, and on the other hand, potassium is being pumped into the cell when there's a lot in the cell and a low amount out of the cell. So they're going against their concentration gradient. So that's active transport example. Okay, fun analogy. <laughs> fun analogy time. Let me see what time it is. Uh, okay, we're good. My fun analogy uh, <laughs> is when you're going on vacation and you just started packing, right? And your suitcase is empty. You start throwing in clothes, right? Easy, just throwing them in, not much energy, no energy required, just like bleh, bleh, bleh. And Then it starts to fill up. And all of a sudden, you forgot to pack your jacket, you're going skiing or whatever, uh, or your bathing suit, your flip flops, you're going to the beach, Hawaii, whatever it is. And you gotta force it in there because it's already pretty full. And so you're like, get in, get into that suit, man. You got to put in that energy and stuff it in so that it fits. That's kind of what's going on here. So with our previous forms of diffusion, that was when the suitcase is empty. You have a lot of clothes that you're packing, low concentration in your suitcase, nothing, nothing in there. And you got a bunch of clothes and you're just throwing them in high to low. No energy. Oh, this is easy. Then all of a sudden, high concentration in your suitcase. And you want to add something else. One more thing. You got to put in energy to push it in there. And that's active transport. You're going from low and now to high concentration. You're stuffing it in there and you've got to put in that ATP energy to get it into your suitcase. That's my favorite analogy to use. <laughs> um, okay. Last form of transport I'm going to do in blue. It's the movement of water. And if I actually go back to the slides first. You see how these, the first two forms of transport, simple diffusion, by the way, it's here, there you go. Simple diffusion and facilitated diffusion, uh, they're, both poor, yeah, they're both forms of passive transport, meaning there's no ATP, no energy requirement, right? Uh, versus our last example with active transport needed ATP. Uh, I'm going to tell you another type of diffusion that's passive transport. All it is, it's the passive transport of water. And water's interesting because it can it can move through what cell membranes by simple diffusion, or it can also move by facilitated diffusion, both. The reason it does both is because, just really quick, is because, remember, water's kind of charged, right? Or it is. It has a polarity. And so it has a hard time doing simple diffusion, going straight through the membrane. It can do it. It can do it, but slower, much slower. Like maybe one or two can kind of weasel their way through that lipid bilayer. But its preferred method is to do facilitated diffusion through a protein, much easier, much quicker, much more efficient form of transport, but it can do both. That's the important thing. So either case, the transport of water has a special name. Does anyone know what it's called? You've probably heard of it, the transport of water, the simple diffusion of water. So I'm gonna, the definition will be the simple diffusion of water. It is osmosis, yeah. Osmosis is whenever water is doing simple diffusion by, did I say simple? I meant uh, passive, right? Yeah, 
passive transport of water. So it can do simple diffusion or facilitated. The proteins in facilitated diffusion that transport water, they're called aquaporins, um, but you don't have to know that. The passive transport Okay. Perfect. So we have four minutes left and I have a short little cool video that summarizes all these forms of transport. Uh, so I want to show you that. If I can find it, I should have it up. We get all our energy and organic molecules. Okay, can I work, please? Oh, maybe I have to try, let me try this. Okay, here we go. Molecules from food. Before we can use the molecules we eat, they have to enter our cells, starting with the cells lining the small intestine. Let's zoom in to the surface of a cell. The plasma membrane is selectively permeable. Some molecules can move across it, while others cannot. How do materials enter and leave cells? Lipids, such as these yellow molecules, can dissolve in the lipid bilayer. Notice how they move down their concentration gradient, from where they are more concentrated where they are less concentrated. This is an example of diffusion. Diffusion is a form of passive transport. It does not require energy from the cell. Most molecules can't cross the lipid bilayer. Here, the sugar fructose moves into intestinal cells by facilitated diffusion, moving down its concentration gradient through a transport protein. Facilitated diffusion doesn't require energy from the cell. So it's also a form of passive transport. Water crosses the plasma membrane by facilitated diffusion or by diffusing across the lipid bilayer directly. The diffusion of water across a membrane is called osmosis. The sodium potassium pump moves ions against their concentration gradient from where they are less concentrated to where they are more concentrated. This requires energy from the cell and is known as active transport. Energy from ATP is used to move sodium ions out of the cell and potassium ions in. Another type of active transport is co-transport. Here, both sodium ions and glucose move into the cell through a co-transporter protein. Sodium ions move down the concentration gradient created by the sodium potassium pump, and glucose moves against its concentration gradient. Okay, um, I actually should have stopped the video before co transport. You don't have to know that one. Uh, that's it. I just wanted to kind of visually show you. I like I like those videos sometimes. The graphics they show. Um, so you can kind of picture what this uh, process looks like. But uh, it's like 4 15, so on the dot. That's it. Next time we're going to talk about organelles inside cells and uh, their functions, their roles. But for today, that that's we're done. So questions, lecture, lab, um anything at all and that's it yeah <laughs> so any any questions about today's what was the definition for osmosis i would say 
the passive transport slash or diffusion of water, either by uh, simple diffusion or facilitated diffusion across the plasma membrane. Any other questions, lecture, lab? Of course, if uh, anything comes up, just shoot me an email and uh, we can do office hours. We can, can answer it through the email. Oh, perfect, cool. Yeah, you're probably, people are probably typing, so no worries. Uh, I'll just, uh, I'll wait here, no, no rush. Okay, so to answer Glorianne's question, the only form of transport that requires energy is active transport. That is it. All other forms uh, do not require energy. Uh, the last page, that's correct. You do not do that page. That's correct. It's, it's when it says your assigned environmental factor on that page, you don't do. We're gonna focus on that next week. Yeah. You still want us to turn this portion, portion, turn this portion. I don't know, I, I don't know what you mean. Oh, oh, the last page? Yeah, it doesn't matter. Yeah, uh, if you're, it, is what you mean uh, submitting the last page blank? It, it doesn't matter. Everything up to the last page. And if you include it, it's all, yeah. Just leave it blank. Cool. All right, other questions? All right, then that's it. So Tuesday, We'll pick up with cell organelles and continue talking about cells. All right, guys. Thank you. Have a great weekend.